If you search up China Africa, there's heaps of content available, and to be honest, there's actually some pretty good commentary on the issue. So why add to the plethora, you might ask? Well, a lot of these videos deal with the what. Johnny Harris's gives great detail on the infrastructure projects that the Chinese government has built, and then Polymatter deals with the nature of the Belt and Road. And so given that the what behind this topic has already been covered, today's video will focus on something else, the why. What piece in the global chessboard does Africa play for China, and how has Africa tried to leverage China's Cold War with the US for their own development? It's hard to make the case that the future of the world belongs with the West, so stay tuned to see how China is moving its rook further along the chessboard. So historically, Mao Zedong always saw Africa as the most fertile soil in terms of foreign intervention. It existed as something of an intermediate zone between the Soviet Union and America, and unlike Latin America and the Middle East, it never quite neatly fell under America's sphere of influence. And so Mao supported the Simba rebels in the Congolese crisis in the 1960s, and then briefly supported the Angolan communists in the 1970s. It's also important to remember that when Chiang Kai-shek's Republic of China was kicked out of the UN and replaced by Mao's PRC in 1971, it was actually African votes that got the PRC over the line. Fast forward 40 years to the 2010s, and Africa largely slipped off Trump's radar as Trump focused much of his foreign policy attention to China itself. This has left a vacuum that China has eagerly sought to fill, and not without good reason. Africa has long been China's main supporter on the world stage, they're seen as a long-term supplier of natural resources and energy, plus they have 1 billion potential consumers of Chinese goods. But still, there's even more at stake. The West has long sought to turn Africa into liberal democracies, and democratic reforms have often been part of loan deals. If China has success in becoming the dominant sphere of influence, Africa would be a major puzzle piece in delegitimizing global liberal capitalism as the norm. Yet even still, Africa serves even more purposes. Unlike the USA, Xi Jinping's People's Liberation Army has had little battlefield experience, with most experience coming through border skirmishes. Since decolonization, Africa has had many civil wars, insurrections, and rebellions, and as a result, the African Union constantly requires soldiers of their security missions, which for Xi Jinping is the perfect opportunity to train his soldiers. Finally, Africa's population is booming, and with China's population potentially halving by the end of the century, having such a big population under its sphere of influence will be vital for both economic prosperity, and in having a coalition of allies against a potential lineup that could include America, India, Japan, South Korea, Australia, the UK, and perhaps the broader EU. Okay, so I'm not going to bore you with an extensive list of every infrastructure project. Quite frankly, there are simply too many of them going on, but just to give you an indication of how strong China's presence is in Africa, these are some interesting stats. China makes up 53% of Africa's smartphone market, mostly through the budget phone Tenko. Coming in at second is Korea's Samsung, which makes up 15% of the market, and I'm sure you would have heard the phrase that data is the oil of the 21st century, so not only is China the leader in a field, it's a leader in perhaps the most important one. Now, when it comes to foreign direct investment in Africa, China and the West have two very different approaches. For the most part, the West has refused to fund economic infrastructure, instead preferring aid in health and education. As I said before, any loans made to African governments have also been done with the quid pro quo of democratic reforms. Conversely, China's loans have no conditions about the style of government, but rather than aid, most of its funding has been through repayable loans. From 2015 to 2021, out of the 120 billion US dollars invested in Africa, only 5 billion came through aid. Now this is where people point towards China quote unquote debt trapping nations by giving them loans that they can't repay in return for strategic assets. The example that they point towards is the Sri Lankan port of Hambantona that China gained on a 99 year lease after Sri Lanka was unable to repay their debt. Though this isn't a bad byproduct for China, the expense that intentionally debt trapping all of Africa would rack up would be unfeasible for Xi, and would actually go against his own vision of having an income on par with the USA by 2049. When it comes to security, at the 2019 China-Africa Peace and Security Forum, the two increased defense ties as China agreed to supply arms, equipment, and surveillance technology to Africa. In his book, The Avoidable War, which as always I highly recommend, Kevin Rudd makes the good point that China has an increasing diaspora across Africa, which the PLA needs to give protection to. Lastly, China has also effectively used vaccine diplomacy in Africa. While Africa was annoyed with China for the outbreak of the virus, China's response in Africa was far swifter than the West's, as they distributed millions of vaccines months before the G7 had finalized their vaccine plan for Africa. 
Okay, so it's time to enter the speculative territory of piecing together what all this Chinese influence will mean for the geopolitics of the 2020s. Let's start with world order. United together, Africa has a voting bloc of 50 nations. Sudan, Mali, Guinea and Burkina Faso are all suspended from the African Union and so they could go rogue. At any multilateral forum, this is considerable sway and provides a strong dissenting opposition to the coalition of Western nations that have largely dominated the UN under American leadership. With Trump pulling back America's involvement in the United Nations by leaving the Paris Climate Accord, this has left a good vacuum for China to fill. In return for gaining this block of 50 votes, China can leverage its own trump card, the veto on the UN Security Council. This closely knit web of alliances could turn a localized war over say Taiwan or the South China Sea into a global war really quickly. Secondly, China's involvement in Africa could rapidly contribute to the development of the continent. In 2012, they replaced America as Africa's largest trading partner, and they now represent 200 out of Africa's global annual $700 billion in trade. That's four times that of America. It is, however, worth noting that they are fifth in terms of foreign direct investment, as they fall behind America and Africa's former colonial occupiers, France, the UK, and the Netherlands. What this means, though, is that for the first time in its history, Africa has leverage and can play the two off against each other for the best investment. So far, China's direct investment has been concentrated into five nations in Central and Southern Africa, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Uganda, Zimbabwe, and Angola. But other nations like Kenya are now looking at this and abandoning their traditionally close ties with America. It's also worth noting that in 2019, a Pan-Africa Afrobarometer study showed that the majority of Africans considered China's involvement in the continent to be positive, and if you look through the comments on all the Chinese African videos, the anecdotal evidence seems to back that up. However, one of the main risks to this Chinese plan is ethnic tensions. For many of the infrastructure projects, Chinese rather than African labor is being used. China's whole marketing around their investment is that they're stimulating the economy through infrastructure, and so many Africans push back against this by saying it's hardly local stimulation if the money is going into the pockets of Chinese workers rather than African workers. This has led to some questioning whether the Chinese model of investing in infrastructure is actually better for them than the Western model of aid to essential services. In that same 2019 study, though most Africans said that Chinese investment was a good thing, China lost the favorability matchup to America 32 to 23. The main risk for China is a local uprising in protest of Chinese labor that diverts PLA resources away from the chessboard and to suppressing the uprising. However, in my analysis, I'd still say that Africa has been a very helpful player in China's quest to dethrone America as the world leader. My main hope is that it doesn't drag even more people into a potential war between the two superpowers. And that's about all I have time for. If you found this video helpful, you can't miss the video we did on China's historic relationship with the non-US quad partners. This one was also a little shorter because I'm working on the framework for a new series on Australia. You don't want to miss it. We can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.